And uh, thank you, Ashley, for really testing us with uh, our rhythm there and also um, our flexibility with those, uh, those moves at the beginning. I felt at the beginning, I was like, oh, and then uh, had to hold my back in place. So um, cheers. Good morning and welcome, Jubilee. My name is Kwaku. I'm just going to give us a few announcements this morning. Um, just to say a warm welcome to you if you are visiting us for the first time. Um, I hope you have been blessed by the service so far. I hope your back is intact and your rhythm is in peace. <laughs> um, but yes, <laughs> yes, we can pray for you afterwards. Um, please don't rush off after the service. Um, like I said, if you are visiting us for the first time, we would love to get to know you. Um, our welcome team would love to say hello. Um, and so you can find them outside just there in the um, foyer. We have a lovely gift to give you as a welcome um, gift. It's in the form of a book. Um, so don't rush off. Come by, um, say hello. We'd love to know what brings you here this morning. Um, just to say, as a local church, we do believe in giving, and our giving goes to supporting much of the church's various ministries across the city. So um, most folk do give via EFT if you are a member of Jubilee and um, you call it home and you don't give yet. Um, we encourage you to try and give, um, and if you do want to part with some cash, there is a uh, box outside on the way on your way home. Um, uh, just to say, we, our kids ministry is looking for volunteers this holiday season. I know that everyone is feeling that end of year slog. Um, we're all just trying to clamber there, trying to get to the end of the year. Um, and what that means often is that many people go away. Um, and so, um, sometimes we group the kids together and we think this is an opportunity for you to check out the fun and excitement that our kids' ministries has to offer. So we're encouraging volunteers just to commit to one, one Sunday between December the 15th to the 5th of January, just to um, give our regular kids' leaders a well-deserved break. And I think um, as much as we all want a well-deserved break, um, our kids' uh, workers also deserve that. And so we would love to support them by doing that. If this is a ministry that you might feel like God is calling you to, um, to serve in, please do sign up. Um, the information is on the slide behind me, um, but you can also find Kaylin um, or speak to our welcome um, folk at the desk. Uh, finally, just to say, our young adults um, at Kloof Ministry is having a year-end event on Saturday, the 16th of November. So please do contact Diana. Her details are behind me um, on the screen, just to RSVP if you plan to go, if you consider yourself a young adult within that certain age range, um, yeah, please just get in touch. <laughs> um, that's it from me. All of our upcoming events are on a notice board outside. And like I said, if you've missed anything, speak to our welcome team. That's it from me. Who am I welcoming next? So, okay. Okay, I'll just do the interview. Now. Yeah. Well, hi, everyone. You'll be pleased to know that I'm alive. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I just didn't need to die to get that round of applause. Um, before oh, you touch my um, what? What happened? Um, oh, I see. He's just making sure that it's not having a vision. Um, just before I preach, which I'm, I'm going to do. Um, we wanted to, as a leadership team and as elders across the whole church, we wanted to introduce to you the one couple that you probably don't know so well. We've proposed three men for eldership after a long process, careful process, a prayerful process. Uh, and you probably don't know Darren and Chrissa Vihan. Um, you may know Darren a little, and you may know Carissa if you've ever gone to worship, if you've been serving in the kids' work and you've gone to the evening service. So I wonder if Darren and Carissa can come up. We'll just do a stand-up interview, if that's okay. Oh. okay. And I'm just going to ask some basic questions. Here they are, in all their glory. Darren and Carissa... Uh, let me just kick off, first of all, just by asking you, both of you, how you came to Christ. Uh, me first. Yeah, it's important that we know that potential 
leaders and elders have come are to Christ. Christian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is important. Um, yeah, so there's a long version, but I'm going to give you the short one. Eh? Thank you. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, actually, I grew up in an atheist family, uh, didn't know anything about Jesus or God, and my parents were far away from, from Christianity as a relationship, or even as a religion. And I didn't know how lost and broken I was. I knew that I was in a broken family, but I had a friend of a friend who was courageous and bold enough to invite this broken person along to a youth group one Friday night in my teens. And I don't know how he got the courage to do that. It must have been the Holy Spirit because I was a wild one in my teens. I would not have invited me, um, and he did. And uh, after many months of prayer, apparently, he eventually invited me along. And I came along, and I, after attending this youth group for a number of months, I went on a camp. And on that camp, I heard the gospel, the good news of mm. Jesus Christ for the first time with real clarity. I heard about God's forgiveness through Christ for me. And I responded. And in my response, I received his forgiveness. And then there was a moment there was real brokenness between my relationship with myself and my mom. There was a lot of bitterness, a lot of resentment. We hadn't spoken in years. And that forgiveness I received, God gave me the power to forgive my mom and has redeemed that relationship and we are now as close as we've ever been. Wow. And I'm so grateful uh, to him for Fantastic. that. Fantastic. I have a very different story. <laughs> um, I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor um, kind of all of my life. My mom was always in the worship team. I think I get it from her. Um, but we, we had our home, and then our second home was the church. We just spent equal amounts of time at either. Um, and so I kind of... I, Apparently, when I was three, my mom prayed with me and I received Jesus, but I don't have memory of that. Um, but for me, I was just reflecting a lot of my relationship with God has been journey. There wasn't like a moment where I accepted Jesus, though I did. I definitely did. Um, but I just, I just grew up knowing the truth of God. Um, but it was when I was 16 and I was filled with the Holy Spirit that my relationship with God became real. And it wasn't just my parents faith and what they believe, but it really became what I believe and who I love, and my relationship with God became real, and it's just been more and more journey and growing since then as well. Mm. Wonderful. So good. And then, briefly, how did you kind of find your way to Jubilee? Are you kind of... No, so, but, I didn't okay. say it. Okay. I said a youth group. Ah. That youth group was Jubilee. Oh, <laughs> a reveal. So, yes, I was invited by a friend to a Jubilee youth group in OBS, and it was there that I had my first experience of Jubilee, and it was on that camp, a Jubilee summer camp, that I got saved. And so, I've been part of Jubilee now, 18 years. Wow. Great. I sure. mean, one of the things, we'll get to it in the sermon, is... You gave your life to Jesus, mm. but you immediately joined a local church. Yeah. I mean, there was, you didn't think, oh, shall I do this? It was kind of a natural progression from conversion. Carissa, Absolutely. how about you? Um, so I used to visit Jubilee very often because my sister and her husband were there, and I was in high school, and I would come um, for, like, holidays. I would come stay with them for a while. And so I had visited here and there, and I kind of felt like I knew the space but then I went and studied at Stellenbosch, and I went and did my community service here in Clan William, and I came back to Cape Town. I was like, I definitely want to be in Cape Town, but this is the first time that I'm going somewhere, and I get to choose which church I'm going to. And I was like, I'm going to like try all the churches, and I felt God be like, you're going to Jubilee. And I said, no, I'm going to just try out. And I went to a few, and I got to Jubilee, and I was like, okay. I'll just stay at Jubilee then. <laughs> I just felt really at home. And yeah, it was just, it's just such a lovely space and the people and the worship and the Holy Spirit. It was just, I, there was no way I was going anywhere else. It's <laughs> great. And then and she met someone at Jubilee as well. Yeah, that's not uh. part of this. Um, <laughs> I don't actually remember meeting him. <laughs> Everything no is does. journey in my life. <laughs> um, lastly, just briefly again, what are you most enjoying about serving in Jubilee? Because both of you are serving continually, week by week, day by day even, you know, in a number of different ways. But what are you most enjoying in terms of how you're serving in Jubilee? So I think what, I'm, what I really love about serving, and I have to start 
back where I started with you guys earlier. And that is, when I came to this youth group, there was a youth pastor who really cared for me, who would come to hospital when I was sick, who would attend my sports games when my parents weren't there. And they gave me so much love. And they showed me the love of Christ. Mm. And it's such a joy to be able to be a part of the community where God has used people to grow and shape me to love and serve people in the same way. And so it really is with joy that I get to serve. I love seeing people take the next step in their faith. I love seeing people have moments of breakthrough. I love being involved in people's lives. And it's all because of what God's done in my life that I get to be able to be a part of what he's doing in others. And so I just, I would love to do that for the rest of my life. Um, And that's what I feel God's called me to. Fantastic. Uh, Yeah, lots of different things, but I think the main thing that I really enjoy and always have is um, the worship um, space. I've always really just connected with God in a very deep way in worship, Um, and I love, I particularly enjoy the season we're in right now as Jubilee. I feel like there's a new stirring of the Holy Spirit, and there's a new openness to the Holy Spirit, not just in worship, but also in worship, and I just, I love I love that space. I've always felt most at home wonderful. there. So that's probably my, my wow. favorite. Absolutely wonderful. So it's Darren and Carissa. They're not going to rush away, I hope, after the service. So please do grab them, have a chat with them, get to know them. And uh, we're trusting God that he will fulfill his purposes for their lives. Um, as you know, we've, we're also proposing Seville um, who you know already, you know Saviwe and Des and Vaughan and Vaughan and Natalie you know well from this congregation. But we are asking for feedback as well. So we're not just looking for negatives, but for positives as well. So we know that there's been like lots of applause and lots of enthusiasm, but it would be wonderful to, for me anyway to be able to say to the church, we, we think this is right, it seems good to us and the Holy Spirit, but it seems good to us is based on some feedback that we're getting from folk as well. So we do want to encourage you to give that feedback. But guys, we're so glad you're with us. Bless you, and thanks for sharing this morning. You can give the mic to Siviwe. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sorry? Go for it, Siviwe. You're in charge. So we, we have we've been traveling and uh, when I say we, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about myself and Tim. All the way from Sitkap. Wow, Elton. Elton, yeah. Elton. Oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask him to, to do the African thing that we do, that you actually bring... Get a toy toy. Well, <laughs> you missed out. We were toy toying earlier. Oh, uh, sorry. It would be good just to bring a greeting and everything else. What, we can like sure. I'll, I'll be very brief. My name is Tim. It's so good to be with you guys. Um, was it six months ago we had you guys with us? Six months ago we had a wonderful experience. A whole bunch of people from South Africa rocked up at our church for the leadership conference. And these guys came with what I imagine you guys are all very familiar with. The most enthusiasm we have ever seen in a bunch of leaders. We're like, how are you guys so excited about the work that God is doing? We had a wonderful time with you guys. It was so much fun. Um, and then uh, a few months ago... Um, uh, uh, obviously I'm part of a uh, new community in South East London and uh, you guys have joined us as part of the New Ground family and uh, some of you will be familiar with that I'm going to put that up a bit so people Better, get my you bad. on the, you can on hear the me recording hello, hello, hello. Um, uh, uh, so, I'm, so we're obviously part of the New Ground family and we're very excited about you guys joining but obviously there's a bit of a distance between most of us in Northern Europe and you guys down here on the other side of Africa. And I'm like, oh man, it was so wonderful seeing them. We'll see them again in a few years time. And then very <laughs> randomly, my company said, um, we've, got a, we've got a trip going out to our development partners in, in Cape Town. Was just wondering if you'd like to go. And I said, there is nowhere else in the world I would like to go than, than Cape Town. And so I have had a wild week meeting uh, a few of the people um, from Jubilee. Um, if some of you were here 12 years ago, my brother Liam Windsor Brown did FP here. And some of you remember him. He was telling me over the phone how angry he was that I get to be here and he's not. <laughs> but um, it, in all seriousness, what is wonderful is there were so many things with this wider culture in South Africa that I'm unfamiliar with. I walk these streets, or rather don't walk these streets, and, and I'm surrounded by things that I, I, I'm familiar and are unusual, but I walk in here yeah, with brothers and sisters in Christ and I'm home. 
Yeah. yeah. They were so wonderful when our values, they don't just span this church, they span the world. Huh? And so I'm so encouraged and, um, and stirred by God of what God is doing amongst you. So thank you so much for welcoming me. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm sure I'll catch some of you later on. Thank Brilliant. You. Thanks, Wonderful. Steve. Thank you. Just a couple of uh, things before I get into the message. I don't want to keep us too long. Uh, one is that if you're visiting, I don't know if this has been said already, but this isn't where we normally meet. So we are, and those of you are sitting out in the courtyard, uh, apologies, but th this is temporary. Um, I'm not sure we'll be back in our main auditorium next Sunday, but we should in the next couple of Sundays. Um, some of you are laughing because you know there's a wedding on the 30th that it needs to be finished. Um, but God has given us such a blessing in this place. His, his, his presence has been with us. People have gathered, and there's a sense of grace and the kindness of God that is upon us. And we trust as well clarity in, in terms of the truth of the gospel that our community keeps growing. And so we've, for the first time since this building was actually put up, we've extended the auditorium. Uh, it'll give us 88 more seating space. And I'm just amazed at how big that new space is. So I don't recommend that you go into that space, although it's possible to, but it's not advisable to because it is a building site. But I'm amazed at how big the new space actually is. Um, that's part of it. We're also going to be putting in new glass. We'll have a proper aircon system, a bit like this one is, that actually keeps you cool when it's warm. And likewise, a heating system that will actually keep us warm when it's cold. So just bear with us, but keep praying. This is a new day for us, and we are grateful to God for it. And then secondly, you'll, you'll know, I'm sure you all know, uh, those of you who are regularly here, that I did have a very serious situation with a heart failure. It was essentially, it, I'll say this to you because it may save your life. If ever you feel a dark lightsaber type pain open up inside your chest and go down the middle of your left arm, it is not good. And uh, when that happened, I, uh, I, I kind of checked that it wasn't like in a weird indigestion or some kind of lung thing. You know, I took a puffer just to see. Uh -uh. It was obviously alien and dangerous. And I didn't just roll over and go to sleep and think, oh, I'll check it again in the morning. I woke Joe up. She sped me down to Vincent Pilotti. And we were based, and then they... Once I'd finally got in, because the guy at first at accident emergency, I said, I'm having a cardiac thing. He said, oh, go and take a seat over there in the waiting area. <laughs> like, no, 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 it's happening right now. And he didn't do anything. And then fortunately, a medic or an orderly or someone just kind of walked across. And I just said, I'm having a cardiac thing right now. And he took me through into resuscitation. And very, very quickly, they gave me a handful of tablets which were, was key in the whole story. Never taken five tablets at once before. Put, took them, and then they did some blood tests. Anyway, went up to intensive care, and then a little later had surgery with two stents put in the heart. I'm still kind of slowly getting there, so I'm not quite fully back up to uh, normal energy levels. And I'm also a bit nervous of pushing it as well, which I've been told not to do. But preaching's fine, don't worry about that. <laughs> um, <coughs> um, the thing was, a few years ago, <coughs> I did this whole, I used to get these pinpricks in my heart and didn't think anything of it until I saw a comedian on the TV saying, who'd had m a massive heart attack. He, he said, uh, someone asked him, weren't there any signs? And he said, yeah, I used to get these pinpricks, but I didn't think anything of it. And I thought, ah, oh, I get those. So I went for a full range of tests, the ultrasound, the running on the treadmill, the, what's it called, the C, e, ECG, the ECG, everything, <coughs> and, they, and blood tests, and they said, nah, it's nothing. Went to a cardiologist a bit later, did all those same tests again, nah, not really, you're fine. After the pain 
of the initial pain subsided after about two hours. The next morning, I felt so normal after the thinners and the anticoagulants and so, that the cardiologist said, look, let's just do a whole range of tests. It was exactly the same tests, and it showed exactly the same result. There's probably nothing wrong. There was an irregularity at the very end of the treadmill, the last few seconds. He just spotted something, and he said, look, normally I wouldn't bother with this if you come in for a normal checkout, check up and these were the results, I would just say, okay, you need to watch it here, there, but you're fine. But because, he didn't use the word testimony, but you can see how this is going to link to the message. But because of how you, how you described your experience, because of your experience last night, I'm going to actually suggest let's do an angiogram. Now, an angiogram is when they go into a vein in your thigh or you, the I think the less urgent one goes into your wrist. I'm not quite sure what the difference is. Anyway, they put it into my thigh. They, they shoot dye into your blood. And then it's all happening in, in theater, in surgery. You can see on the screens through these different cameras that are hovering over you. It's a bit like being in a Star Wars spaceship type thing. You've got your hands behind your head like this. Um, they can see what's happening in the blood because of the dye. And so he said, first artery, absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong. Second artery, nothing wrong at all. Third, which you've got three, the main one, the left arterial descending one that pumps more than 50% of the blood to the heart. Medical people are nodding, <laughs> which is great. Um, uh, he said, oh, there it is. Okay, he said, you were right. Now, I mean, I, I knew I was right because of what I experienced, but there wasn't really a a question about that, but it was like he was just verbally, and he said, okay, definitely going to need to put a stent in, and I'll tell you that story another time, because that was the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life, and then he said, we have to do another one, and that was even worse, because I knew how long that 20 minutes was horrible. Anyway, um, so I said to him, so what happened then on the, on the Monday night? And he, he said, if you hadn't come in, and if you hadn't got the treatment if you hadn't come in when you did, and you hadn't got the treatment when we gave it to you, you would have had a massive heart attack. So and the reason I'm telling you this is listen to what's going on, and don't try and man up if you're a guy. Don't kind of... I've spoke to a friend of mine who had some major thing that went wrong, and he didn't, he didn't get out of bed because he didn't want to wake up his wife. He thought she'd be annoyed... If he, if he woke her up in the middle of the night and then it was all a bit of a kerfuffle, he's, she's busy the next day. And what happened was worse because of that. So listen to what's going on and respond. The other lesson for the sermon, I've spoken too long on it, sorry, is you can have a certain amount of information, okay? This is medical, this is scientific data that doesn't actually give you a full, accurate reading of the situation. The angiogram does. That's actually, I'm amazed that they haven't devised anything that can tell you what's really going on. But the dye into the vein is the best way of doing it. So you can, as a non-believer, you can get a certain amount of information about God and about Jesus and ah, maybe it's something, maybe it isn't. Don't discount a person's experience what they are telling you, even when it sounds like vulnerable and silly, I, God answered my prayer for this, that, or the other. I, I know what the love of God is because I've experienced the love of God. Coupled together, the data, the information, which is kind of non-emotional, coupled together with a witness of someone's experience could actually lead you to making a life-saving, soul-saving, eternity-saving decision for Jesus Christ. Did you see that? So I know that's a bit of a cheesy segue, but that, that kind of made me really think. So what I want to do today, we're starting a four-part series. We're looking at essentials. What are the essentials of the gospel message this week? Um, next week, we're gonna, Vaughan's going to lead us. We're going to talk a little bit about making connections with people in the workplace and other contexts. 
After that, we're going to look a little bit at facing different objections. And then finally, in the fourth week, before we kick off our Christmas series, how do you actually lead someone to Christ? So we've had a God, us, others theme for this year, which I think is, we haven't got the juice out of it yet. It'll probably carry it into next year as well. We haven't really focused on the others in terms of equipping us to share the good news. So that's what this, this series is about. There are loads of challenges that we face in Cape Town. You know them, I know them, in terms of our wanting to communicate the truth of Jesus to people. First of all, people think they are Christian. There's a lot of people who still would say, well, I'm Christian, which means I'm not a Muslim, or I'm not a Hindu, you know, and we need to serve those people and help them realize that there's such a thing as real faith and a genuine relationship with Jesus that is transformative. Uh, without, you know, these people get, if they're proud, they get offended at the, that you seem to be saying that I'm not a Christian. So we need to navigate that carefully. And there's also a growing number of people in Cape Town who either are or were genuine believers, but have given up on church. There's loads and loads of people in Cape Town who have either had a negative experience of a heavy-handed leadership or authoritarianism or whatever it is, and they've given up on church. I don't think this is true in the UK by any means, but because of the, the, the much larger kind of Christian population that, praise God, we enjoy here in, in South Africa, there are significant numbers of people. Now, we are not, they're not the focus of our evangelistic mission. The reason I mention them is that they can confuse the conversation because they are also in relationship with non-believers around them, and it can bring confusion into the, into the missional conversations that we have. And that's partly because of what we can already see is true, that a gospel of Jesus without the church very quickly becomes a gospel of Jesus without the New Testament at all, or with bits of it black, blacked out, redacted, or even rewritten under the, the bogus assertion of Greek scholarship. In actual fact, we need to return to the essentials because the non-believers around us are not only exposed to the unrealistic, non-supernaturalist worldview, which doesn't explain life even though we work and learn and study, particularly in the sciences, of course, in that realm, um, but it's not an explanation for the whole of life. They're also exposed to a religious worldview which has different flavors, the, the old religions of Islam and Hinduism. And, all, and this new kind of, I don't know, various revisions of Christianity. I don't think that is a new thing in and of itself. But the non-churched Christian, the unchurched Christian, uh, is a new challenge for the non-believer as well. So What's our response? Our response is that we love people and we want to tell them about the goodness of Jesus, but we need to be clear on the essentials. And we're going to look at some of those essentials now. I don't expect you to remember all of this. All of this is going to be by way of reminder. You actually already know what I'm going to preach. So some do's and don'ts, which I want to suggest to you in terms of our witness, and this is from 40 years of experience what you don't need to do. Number one, and I've made all these mistakes, by the way, you don't need to cram everything in in the first conversation with a non-believer who's open to hearing more. Okay, don't overfeed. Don't over-deliver. Don't flood the market. However, whatever analogy you want to use, <laughs> just let the person who's interested make the discovery in conversation with you as well. Second, that doesn't mean don't tell the truth. Tell the truth, but don't stuff everything in because you're overexcited that now this person is open. You know, every, I mean, people make this mistake all the time. Secondly, even when someone says something provocative or hostile or daft, just completely daft, don't become aggressive in return. Don't react. 
don't swing at everything that comes. Don't launch into corrective mode. Have you, have you met Mr. Corrective? He just can't let it go. He's got to correct that. He's got to correct. What does that do? It diminishes relationships. It breaks relationships down when, when you're in Mr. Corrective mode. Here I come. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, if someone's aggressive to you, turn the other cheek. You know, use the incredibly vulnerable and not very powerful sounding, I love Jesus. <laughs> this is my experience of Jesus. Jesus is at the center of my life. You think, that's not powerful. When I hear people preach, it seems powerful. When I'm witnessing, it seems weak. It's okay. Thirdly, not many people are convinced by logic or reason. William Lane Craig is a, is a great apologist, but his style is logic. You know, it's, it's classic Greek logic. Socrates is a man, Socrates died, died, men die. You know, it's that kind of logic. And you can't convince someone into spiritual life like that. Can, uh, we, praise God that we're rational creatures. We, we have an intellectual capacity. It's very important that we do. Um, but don't conceal your own stories of God's help or of answered prayer. Because our world is filled with echoes and clues of another world. And you and I are in touch with God, the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and let those clues come through. Don't conceal them. Not everyone is... William Lane Craig, actually, although he's a logician in that sense in his ministry, which is very helpful once you're a Christian, no question, um, but his actual conversion happened like this. He's at Varsity, and um, there was one particular student that just kept rubbing up the wrong way. He didn't enjoy her at all. She was a young, German, happy student. She was always happy and upbeat and always encouraging, and it just, it just wound him up. He didn't like it. And one time he said to her, why are you always so joyful and happy? And she said, because I've accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Now, that is not the most evangelistically helpful necessarily. It does not even show quite what it communicates. But he said, as soon as she said that, She's joyful because she's accepted Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior. He said it was like an arrow. He's a non-believer, and it hit him, bang, and it changed his life. It led him to going back to the New Testament and, and asking proper questions. Fourthly, I need to rush. I don't think that someone's negative reaction means that they're not interested. Come on. You need to trust God. Don't think that someone's negative reaction means they're not interested. And don't think that someone's negative reaction to your sharing something of your faith means that you did something wrong. I mean, Jesus said this again and again. They reject you. They're rejecting me. Don't blah, 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 shake off the dust of it. We don't do that in evangelism. We just cower away and say, it's not my gift. I don't want to do this anymore. I'll put the chairs out, you, you know? <laughs> When I became a Christian, I started sharing my faith with my family as well as everyone I could meet. And my sister said, was hostile. She said, I cannot believe, I absolutely cannot believe that you now believe this stuff. I didn't know you were so weak. I didn't know you were so easy to be like uh, uh, influenced and manipulated by people. I can't. She was absolutely hostile. Six months later, she gave her life to Jesus, and she said to me, this is what she said to me, as soon as you started saying to me that you'd become a Christian, I knew that I was going to become one, <laughs> and I was fighting it with everything that I could, but I, it was like inevitable. Do not think, that, do not misread someone's hostile or negative reaction to you means either that you did something wrong or that they're not actually interested. There is a God who's at work behind all these things. Anyway, those are the don'ts. Here are the do's. First of all, live a full and rounded Christian life, an unashamed, openly Christian life. Read the Bible. Be devoted to Scripture. 
this is now the driving authority in your life. The, 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 the decision-making key is the Bible. So get to know the Bible really well. And once that is in you, imprinted into your soul securely, read widely. Now, I came from a different direction. Like, like uh, Darren, you know, I was an atheist, so I had already read very widely. I'm in my 20s when I got converted, and I already read very, very widely. And then I came to the Bible and then began to see all these other works of literature and so on in a different, in a different way. But I would say to you, if you've been born, born into a Christian family and you've grown up as a Christian, like uh, Carissa explained or Joe's a similar thing, you have to read more widely. And it's not just about reading. Live in such a way that there are connection points. Vaughan's going to look at this next week. In your life, um, be a good example in the workplace. Be a fantastic example in the workplace or in the family or in your kind of leisure time. Um, be a good example of character and of goodwill and of relationships and of friendliness. You know, live a healthy Christian life openly. That's the first thing. Secondly, pray that God would use you. Pray. I mean, how many times do you, at the beginning of the day, pray and say, Lord, would you help me to have a conversation with someone about Jesus? Help me to have a conversation with someone who doesn't know him about Jesus, whether that's someone you work with or whether that's when someone gives you the spam phone call. I did this with the last spam phone call. I'm really annoyed by these automated spam calls, by the way, because you can't do that. But you still get a real person from time to time. This person was offering me a free gift. And I said, well, are you, are you selling something? No, 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 it's a free gift. And blah, 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 it's something to do with some financial institution. It's financial advice, but there's a free gift. And I, I just said, listen, have you heard of the greatest free gift that's ever been offered to anyone? And I went, I just went off, you know. Now, <laughs> and, you know, in the end, she said, okay, okay, thank you. You don't know. You don't know whether you're talking to someone who's kind of in, in the generic Christian world. It could be a Muslim person who's listening to you on the phone, talk about the Lord Jesus. Anyway, uh, pray, pray that God will be. Paul, in two of the different letters, says, make the most of every opportunity. You know, these are, these are precepts and commands that we want to obey, aren't they? So Ephesians and Colossians, make the most of every opportunity. Thirdly, be filled with the Holy Spirit regularly. Seek God for fresh infillings of his power because Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Not Jehovah's witnesses, but my witnesses. You will talk about me. Fourthly, listen, listen, listen. Learn to listen to the person as well so that you can discern what aspect of Christian truth is most appropriate for them at that moment in that conversation. That what That's why... Certain types of evangelism training don't always help because they leave you with a kind of an ABC that you've got to do this. In actual fact, if you read the Gospels and look at what Jesus did, there are tons of conversations that Jesus had in the Gospels with people who aren't yet followers of his. And you'll see that it's hardly ever the same. He, he is listening to the person. Sometimes it's kind of a, it's pretty strong. Other times, it's very gentle. He's kind of giving all the answers and saying, come, like the woman at the well. So look at what Jesus did. Discern where the person is at. Fifthly, be confident in the power of Scripture, in the power of individual Bible verses, the Word of God itself. There was a trend, certainly when we were in the UK, it's 30 years ago now, of People in evangelism training start saying things like, Billy Graham said, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, and it's irrelevant now in mission. It's irrelevant in evangelism. It's not, it doesn't win people. And it never did. It never did. There's never been a non-Christian who thought, oh, oh, now he's quoting from the Bible. I better listen more carefully. The Bible only is effective when the Holy Spirit the, the words of God are cut you into your heart by the Spirit. They were cut to the heart. 
the Lord opened Lydia's heart to believe the things that are spoken by Paul. So whether someone's ready in your view, whether someone's receptive in your view, it, that's not really the deciding factor. Discern, don't drop that one, but the word of God is powerful all by itself. That's why myself, as a well-read uh, atheist, is totally transformed by what? The word of God. It wasn't Christian witness or it was, wasn't church. I'd never been to church once. About a year before I was converted, we went for a laugh to a, 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 a Christian church. Um, and that had zero impact. Um, but anyway, that's another, a whole other story. I'm just saying, reading the Gospel of John. Now, again, for some people, you could say, well, read the Gospel of John because that worked for Lex. No, no, discern where they're at. But it was the book changed my life. That's, that's my story. It was the Gospel of John that radically changed my life. The words of Jesus going in. Hebrews 4, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Isaiah 55, God says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and don't return there without watering the earth, make it produce and sprout, providing seed for the sower, etc. So will my word be when it goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the purpose for which I sent it. That's my story. Now, it's not everyone's story. Often it's friendship and gradual or going to youth group and then going to a camp and so on. But... Do not think that somehow the Bible is not effective anymore, that the Word of God doesn't really cut through and can transform the hardest heart. I stand before you today as evidence that a total hostile atheist can be radically transformed. The whole trajectory of his life can be completely changed by the Word of God coming with power. And the thing was... It wasn't in dialogue, it wasn't in discussion, it was just the book. So when I contradicted it, it just said the same thing back to me again and again and again. It silently just asserted itself again until Jesus kind of emerged in a way that was like irresistible, dangerously attractive. Anyway, I'm off, let me just get to the... Okay, the sixth thing is just be aware of how you're coming across, which is what I just did then. Um, time to get to the sermon. But just be aware how do you sound like, you know, are you, are you getting drawn away off into peripheral, non-essential issues? Or are you, are you able to keep to the main thing? Okay, the essentials in the last few minutes. And then we're going to watch a short video of a guy who's in our life group who last Sunday was baptized and gave his testimony in one of our New Frontiers churches. So first of all, first essential that needs to be communicated to the non-believers. So these eight, sorry, essentials need to be communicated at some point. Firstly, there is a God. There is a God. Now, I know that's just an assertion. People make assertions all the time. When I was an atheist, I confidently asserted that I knew that there was no God. You're allowed. You're allowed to say that there is a God. Professor Stephen Hawking uh, asserted once that religion is a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. It's a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. Professor John Lennox was asked to respond to that statement. And he said, well, atheism is a fairy story for people who are afraid of the light. <laughs> These are just assertions, and you're allowed to make assertions. You're allowed to make faith assertions, even if the discipline in which you're working has set up a kind of intellectual environment that tries to make any assertion about the supernatural bogus. Uh, if you don't understand that, don't worry. But the point is this. You are, al you are in touch with God, and you're allowed to say so. Secondly, not only is there a God, God is good, and he loves you. God is good, and he loves you. And again, it's an assertion, but it, this one is based on creation. It's based on scripture. It's based on experience. It's similar to the first one. There is a God, and this is what God is like. We do not, the, 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 the Islamic, the descriptions of the Islamic God is a different God. There is a God, and he's a God who loves you and made you, and he's a good God. Again, it's an assertion. 
but make it. Thirdly, we're in the wrong about many things. This is where the fall comes in. We're in the wrong about loads of stuff. We really are. And this is where you need to be a little bit careful in how you share. But basically, we're saying something that's true of all of us. We're not pointing fingers or acting as though we're better than other people. What we're saying is left to ourselves, according to the Bible, left to ourselves, we are wrong in our beliefs about God, beliefs about ourselves, and beliefs about what the Bible calls sin. And sin is defined as breaking the commands of God that are written down in the Old and the New Testaments. That's what defines sin. And so within the Christian message and the Christian belief, we have sinned and we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one who is completely righteous, not even one uh, normal human being, that is. We're, we were all sinners at some point. And even those of us who've been forgiven our sins and we're in a new life now, we know that we're not perfect yet and that we still fail in many ways. But it is very important that, that you don't miss that bit out. Fourthly, by mutual agreement, in love, God sent his son. So there was this moment where God sent his son. And I guess Christmas coming, you know, it's, a, it's an easy time for us to say, actually, what is the whole thing about? Well, God sent his son. We'll talk about why. But that was mutually agreed. There wasn't like a hostile, angry, disfigured with hate God in heaven who, who and the son said, oh, don't worry, I'll sort this out. Um, I'll do something. For it. It's not that. It's not that. By mutual agreement, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are united for your good and for your salvation. Fifthly, nearly there, Jesus is utterly perfect. And his words are life-giving. Now, I don't think you need to say his words are life-giving, but the point is, get them to Jesus. The center, if you forget everything else, in all the other words that I've said, don't forget this, Jesus is the center. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the center of the message. If you go there, everything flows properly from there. We've all sinned, the best person, the only person to have perfectly obeyed God in all things is Jesus himself. And he's not only a perfect man, the Bible teaches he's the Son of God, which means he is God the Son made flesh. God became flesh and lived among us. Jesus is the core essential, the most essential of the essentials. He said, I am the door. And in that sense, if you enter through him, a myriad of peripheral concerns. What about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? What about the environment? What about abortion? What about blah, blah, blah. all the important but secondary issues can be answered through Jesus. If you fight on the secondary issues for creation against the, all that, you just, you're going to end up with different opinions and so you go to Jesus. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200 rand. Go straight to Jesus and preach him. Spurgeon said to preachers, you can preach Christ from every single verse. And if for some reason you can't find Christ in the verse that you're preaching, just jump over the hedge and preach Christ anyway. Because that's the center of everything. That's the center of the communicated message. And of course, it involves, sixthly, Jesus died and rose again. Why did he die? He died on the cross to take the full weight. When he died on the cross, he took literally the full weight of God's righteous anger against our sin and against our evil. Jesus willingly, this is why the willing bit is necessary, willingly stepped in front of us and took the weight of God's punishment against sin in himself when he died on the cross. Why did, he, why did God raise him from the dead? God raised him from the dead because he was satisfied that that sacrifice was sufficient for the forgiveness of the sins of all who believe in him. That's why God raised him from the dead, for our justification, as we read in other, in other places. Seventhly, just two more. And this needs to be communicated, and this is often left out. And if this one's left out, if these next two are left out, you haven't actually 
fully communicated the gospel. You haven't actually been uh, complete, as it were, in your witness. You've told a historical story from a specific religious viewpoint. It's these two next points that really are critical. You need to personally, the person needs to know, you need to personally turn from unbelief and put your faith in Jesus Christ. That means you are, you are turning away from what you previously believed. You are letting go of beliefs and you are turning to Jesus and you're basically saying, teach me again, teach me. I need to learn. Men and brethren, what should we do? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. This promise is for you and your children. Brethren, what should we do? There's a teachability that has to come into play. And so people need to know that when they come in and through Jesus, they're coming in to learn a whole new way of life. And that whole new way of life isn't, well, in Jubilee we do this, or in this church we do that. It's the description that the New Testament gives us about what Christianity is and how it should look. That's what we're going into. In other words, the person needs to want to live a life that's pleasing to God. If they've missed that, they've missed it. So for me in my 20s, I was very happy to um, kind of adopt a baby status. Uh, in the life of the church that I joined. And I knew that's not a permanent position, obviously, but I'm, re I'm learning. I, I lived and done to a certain extent, you know, and I wanted to learn. I was willing to be instructed and corrected even by mature leaders. And in the church that I joined, they were always coming back to what the Bible says in terms of the instruction and the correction. It was never, you know, you should just wear this or not do that or not wear that because that's not how we do it in the church. It wasn't that. It was here's what it says, and that's what we're trying to line up with now into this new life. Hallelujah. So the driver of lifestyle change is the Bible and its descriptions of how the Christian life should look. Both in the Gospels, they are not discounted. Jesus said, Go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing those and teaching them to do all that I've told you. So everything that Jesus taught the disciples is current. There's no sell-by date on it. It's for you. If he says love your neighbor, you love your neighbor. If he says heal the sick, you heal the sick. It's all current still. Gospels and the book of Acts, which describes what the church should look like and how the church should be, still current. And then the epistles, which more precisely, in a way, uh, show us how Christians work out this new life both individually and together. And then finally, to finish on point eight. <laughs> so I, I'm not perfectly back to health here. I haven't given you a three point sermon that you can remember. But get this and listen to it again. Make notes and think, God help me. You need to recognize, this is what we need to say, you need to recognize that you will begin to live a new life. And that new life will look different to your old ones, or your old one in very important ways. You have to, the person that's coming to Jesus has to know that. Otherwise, it's just, well, I, I prayed a prayer, or I, you know, and I'm not downplaying the crisis moments. We'll hear about one of those in the video in a, in a second. I'm not downplaying that, but the person has to realize beforehand, my life will change. It's different from, I need to change my life in order to be accepted in the church or accepted before God. It's not that. They need to realize that if I make Jesus the center of my life, there's going to be big changes. There's going to be changes in my beliefs, my attitudes, my views, my behavior. In private, in public, in church, in the workplace, in life. And so prayer <coughs> is going to be a thing. And worship is going to be a thing. 
And for me, like raising your hands and all of that, when you first, it's like, and then you read it in scripture, or everywhere, raise your hands, clap your hands, smash the symbols. Not so much at the smashing of the symbols. Greet each other with a kit. No, 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 no. There are some things that maybe are changeable. No, no, not really. Reading his precious word, telling others about what's happened to you. You, you don't go to war without knowing if you've got enough troops. You don't build a tower unless you know you, what it involves. You're letting the person know this is a change that's coming. And then we're not going to get, um, you know, people who say, oh, I tried Christianity. It didn't work. I went forward. I prayed a prayer. They told me I was fine, and it didn't work. Discipleship is more than that, and it doesn't begin after the response. It begins before as well. And it involves time. It involves time. Because of Jesus' teaching, you're going to be open to the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you and continuing to work with you. And you're going to become a junior member in a new family, just like when a baby joins a family. It's all disrupted, which is great, and we focus on the baby, as we should. There's a focus on the, on the youngest. That's quite right in the local church. You're going to join a local church, and you're going to be eager to want to serve and want to learn and want to discover your gifts and growing gifts that you didn't know you had because you're a disciple of Jesus now. It's very important that we share, I think, these eight things. Other things can be left out, but these things, I think, are essential. There's more, of course, but I just want to leave you with that. Now, I want to end with uh, a Clough Street life group testimony, uh, which uh, is so wonderful. This happened last Sunday. So this is a video of one of our life group members getting baptized uh, last Sunday. And it actually encapsulates quite a few of the things we've been, lo we've been looking at. I know he mentions me a few times. Don't, don't worry about that. But he's really been part of the life group. And it's such a weird thing because it's a jubilee story. It's a new ground story. And it's a King's Church Eastbourne story, which is where Joe and I were. We helped plant that church all those years ago. And it's a Sidcup story because I, I don't know if you were there, but I preached the gospel and this was when Andy responded. So let's watch this video together. And if I cannot cry, I'll end the meeting afterwards. Andy only became a Christian a few months ago. I'm just gonna, I know he'll share that in his story. It's just wonderful just to have this opportunity to baptize him as well. So over to you, Andy. Hello, church. My name is Andy. I'm 65. I'm an actor. Uh, I was brought into a Christian church. My father was an army major. My mother was a teacher. My grandfather was a vicar and came from a long line of Welsh Methodist preachers. But I was sent away to school and church was every day and I didn't really enjoy it because it wasn't welcoming, it wasn't inviting. But I got through it by singing my Welsh heritage allowed me to enjoy singing, music, and rugby. Um, at the age of 10, my grandmother took me to see what became my favorite film, Ben-Hur. I don't know if you know it, but it's a wonderful story. And every Easter, when they showed the, the films of Jesus on the TV, I would cry at the end and think he'd been done badly. But as I left school, I walked away from God as well. I went to university. I never went to church again, except at Christmas for a good sing-song, but that was about it. I became a punk. I rebelled, Mohican and all, and turned my back on God. I then became an actor. I worked in theatre, film, TV, commercials. But at 23, my father died of cancer. And my life became rudderless, and I went off the rails into a hedonistic pursuit of pleasures. I failed in love. I was riddled with rejection in my job, and I blamed God and religion for all the suffering I saw around me. Rejected his teachings at my children's school, and I became an atheist. When I met people who believed in God still, I would mock them. Uh, I thought I was a good man. I was very proud. I helped anyone I saw who needed help, and often for free. In 2001, I was working at the Royal Shakespeare Company, and I had a huge motorbike crash. As the paramedics worked to save my body on the road, I went to a sunlit meadow where I met my grandmother, my great aunt, and others who'd long since passed away. And we walked to a gate in a picket fence, and they asked me to come through. But I knew if I did, I wouldn't return, and I had a five-month-old baby that needed me, so I turned away back to my broken body lying in the road and spent the next four years in a wheelchair learning to walk again, even though the doctors told me I never would. 
Now, despite all that pleasure-seeking, there was a huge, deep, profound emptiness inside me. And in my 50s, divorced, angry, lost, I met my wife online. And she was everything I'd rejected. She's a Christian. She was a pastor. She'd been a church planter. But she was such a lovely and warm and beautiful person. Our discussions were deep, intense and challenging, but never with any malice. She was one of God's own, and I fell in love with her. In 2019, we got a job in Cape Town, and I know that Lex is watching us in Cape Town now. And I met Lex and his wife, Jo, there. Um, they were old friends of my wife, and I wasn't sure how it would go because they were Christians too, and I thought, what are we going to talk about? As it turned out, we had loads to talk about. Music, films, books, life, etc. And they've become great friends. And in the lockdown, their, their Jubilee Church organized an alpha course in, uh, over Zoom which we attended, and Lex made sure we were in his group. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And in fact, I went on to join his life group, and still am a member, have been for four years in Cape Town. Um, and we'd still do that through It turns out that the company of Christians that I so despised as a boy was not as I thought. They were clever, funny, creative, generous and kind, interesting, from all walks of life and great company, and now all friends. Also, my casting started to change recently. I got a job as Pontius Pilate at the National. I then got a job as a pastor in an American film and then became the Queen's chaplain in The Crown. So God has a great sense of humor and uh, starts to mock the mocker. Um, as it turns out, Lex this year came to the leadership conference here in Eastbourne. And he, I was his designated driver and he suggested I stay on and listen to the talk, so I did. And I experienced such joyful singing. I loved the work that was being done in the community to help people in their lives and journeys with God. And I, the more I listened, the more that emptiness inside me started to fill. And on Father's Day this year, at the end of his preach, Lex asked us to say a prayer, a prayer I'd resisted saying for 65 years, inviting Jesus into my life. I said it, and I felt the love of God fill me. The tears flowed, and that pit that was, I'd carried inside was finally gone. And I woke up in the middle of that night and realized I wasn't a good man. I was really a bad sinner. And I had a lot of apologizing to do to God. And I spent that night doing it. And now I love coming to church. I am proud to call myself a Christian. And today I want to come home. And anybody here who's all like me, who thinks, oh, I, I can organize my life, I can do it. No, we can't. We need that support, we need that guidance, we need that help. And I have come back home, and that's why I'm here. And take me home. Andy, have you repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus? Yes, I have. Therefore, it is our great pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Let's stand to our feet together. Let's, uh, let's do that. Let's stand to our feet and we'll pray. And then we can... Parents, you need to go and get your kids pretty much straight away. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we, we really long for more conversions to take place in our city. And I pray for every single one of us who's listened to this message this morning that you would open our mouths and help us to speak. Lord, you would keep us from keeping the truth to ourselves out of such a, a weak thing like embarrassment or fear or pride or nervousness. Lord, we pray that you would enable us to enter the adventure of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those around us. Do help us, every single one of us, to do so, Lord. We want to thank you for your presence, for your power, for the reality of who you are 
We've not hit on something that's fake. We found the real thing. It's, we're like those who have found treasure in a field and who have said, we're willing to let everything else go. This, this is the key thing. And so I pray for us, Lord, as we go now and as we go into this week, that you would help us, Lord, to speak for you, to serve you, and to serve the non-believers around us with the good news of Jesus. And we pray these things in your precious and wonderful name. Amen. 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 God bless you. We'll close there. I think we've gone over a little bit. That's my fault, probably. Well, definitely, in fact. Um, Don't rush away. There's coffee, there's tea. Chat with Darren and Carissa. God bless. We'll see you next week.